So I'd like to thank the chairs for inviting me to present here today. And what I'll be talking about uh, for you all is uh, our work on immune mechanisms in heart failure. So as we all know, heart disease is the leading cause of death worldwide, both in industrialized and in emerging countries. Now, what we've seen is decreased deaths from coronary heart disease, but in that setting, we've seen increased um, deaths and hospitalizations due to heart failure. And what our focus is, is the healing that occurs after cardiac injury. And what, what we're interested in is how this process is modulated by immune mononuclear phagocytes. So I often start with this slide. Uh, what do these three uh, organisms have in common? A salamander, a neonatal mouse, and a newborn human. So if you amputate the limb of a salamander, as you can see here, uh, you have um, essentially a stump, and this will completely regenerate and regrow this limb. The salamander has this amazing uh, regenerative capacity. Now, if you deplete macrophages, an innate immune cell type, instead of uh, regenerating, you have a scar. And if you amputate underneath this scar and you allow macrophages to be present, the limb will regenerate, indicating the macrophages are essential for the regenerative process of the salamander. So our group and other groups have shown that the neonatal mouse immediately after birth also has this remarkable regenerative capacity. And if you deplete the macrophages that are present immediately after birth, what happens is, is you have a scenario that mimics the adult. So rather than regenerating, you form a scar. And Joseph Penninger's group has shown the, new, the, the newborn human also has a similar capacity. And as much as we can tell, uh, they documented a case of a newborn child having a heart attack. And um, despite severe cardiac injury and dysfunction, there was complete restoration of heart function. So all three organisms are capable of full tissue regeneration. Mammals lose this ability with age and instead form a scar. And we know that regeneration is dependent on macrophages. So how do we assess macrophages? The traditional assessment is to take a tissue, to perfuse it to remove circulating immune cells, digest that tissue into a single cell suspension and use flow cytometry. And flow cytometry is a technique where we use antibodies that are fluorescently conjugated and bind to molecules on the cell surface or even potentially within, uh, within uh, the inside of the cell. And here we've picked two uh, molecules present on the surface of macrophages found in the mouse heart, and this is CD11B and CD64. Each dot here represents a cell, and here are all the macrophages that are in the heart. They're the dominant population of cells. And traditionally, what people have called these macrophages um, is, this, is in a way a dichotomy. People would call them an M1 macrophage, which is thought to be an inflammatory uh, macrophage, or they would call them an M2 macrophage, and, and that was thought to be an uh, anti-inflammatory reparative macrophage. But we believe this process of macrophage uh, characterization and, and tracking is much more complex. So what we chose to do is use an unbiased technique uh, to assess all the macrophages at the level of each individual cell. So we isolated and sorted by, uh, by cell sorting all macrophages in a related cell type, dendritic cells. So macrophages are found in this quadrant uh, R2 and dendritic cells can be found in, in R1 where we used some dendritic cell specific markers to isolate them. Dendritic cells are very sparse here. They're found in, in region three. We normalized the ratio, one-to-one uh, -one ratio. And what we performed was a technique called single cell RNA sequencing. And in this technique, we take each individual cell and we sequence all the RNAs that will, that will ultimately make proteins. Uh, we use a technique um, um, from the distributor uh, called 10x Genomics, and this is a, a drop sequence technology where each cell is barcoded and, and, and shot into a, an oil droplet, and then everything is sequenced simultaneously. And we take uh, each cell, and we typically get about two to 3,000 genes per cell, and we call those dimensions. We take all those dimensions, thousands of dimensions, and reduce them into two, and we can visualize each cell based on the sum total of its transcripts. 
And here each dog represents a cell and the closer the cells are to each other, the more similar their transcriptomes are. And here we see a number of different populations of what are macrophages and dendritic cells. Here, uh, um, what's circled is a combination of macrophages and monocytes and what looks like three uh, clusters of cells. Now we took those three clusters of cells, isolated them and then reclustered them. And what we actually observe are five distinct populations. One is a small population here in purple of contaminating circulating monocytes that are found in the blood. And uh, beyond this, we found four subsets of macrophages that live within the heart. And each subset has its own pattern of gene expression. So here are genes uh, expressed as violin plots. Uh, and each cell uh, that's in this cluster is, sh is shown as part of this plot. So the higher the expression, the more there is of this gene. So we have macrophages uh, that express macrophage markers such as C1QA, FCGR1. And we have individual clusters that express unique patterns. For example, we have one cluster here in gold, which we've termed TIMD4 positive macrophages, and they have unique expression of certain transcripts such as TIMD4 and LIVE1. We have a second cluster in green that expresses the chemokine receptor CCR2. Uh, we have a third cluster that's in the middle that expresses high levels of antigen presenting genes. We call these MHC2 macrophages. And lastly, we have a cluster that it, uh, is in blue that expresses interferon inducible genes. And these are genes typically we see in viral infection. However, these are present in homeostasis. For the purposes of this talk, I'll focus on the first three clusters. So when we look at these clusters and we look at the genes that they express, we can see that different pathways are enriched. For example, if we compare the CCR2 cluster in green compared to the TIMD4 cluster in gold, we can see different pathways come up. For example, in the TIMD4 cluster, we see genes that map to pathways uh, that are called regeneration, re, uh, regulation of vascular development, muscle cell proliferation. So it gives you some idea of what TIMD4 macrophages do. And if we compare that to the green cluster, the CCR2 positive macrophages, we see other pathways. We see um, mononuclear cell migration. We see regulation of fibroblast proliferation. We see more inflammatory pathways such as respiratory burst. So we've also looked to see if these macrophages are present in human. We've, uh, uh, we've applied the same technique as we've done in the mouse. And here these samples were obtained from the Sick Kids Hospital through our collaboration with Dr. Seema Mattel. And, and this was derived from a 12 year old uh, patient who was undergoing corrective surgery for a congenital defect. But we've seen, uh, we've sequenced a number of patients and they all have a similar uh, appearance where we have TIMD4 macrophages, MHC2 macrophages, and uh, CCR2 uh, macrophages. And here we have the similar set of markers, C1Q that marks macrophages, FCN1, which marks monocytes on the right, and CD14 that marks macrophages. And here we can see LIVE1, which is well expressed in, in, um, in human. We see TIMD4, to some degree, it's not as well detected in our assays, and we see CCR2 on the other side. We can also detect the protein at the protein level, similar subsets from uh, from children and from uh, human neonates, where we have CCR2 macrophages, LIVE1 macrophages, and these uh, MHC2 macrophages. We wanted to understand um, beyond the transcripts uh, if these cells had different biologic properties. And one of the key biologic properties is if that cell, that macrophage that's in the tissue, if it is self-renewing, and that is a uh, can proliferate and replace itself, or if it requires a, circ a circulating monocyte to come in and become that macrophage. That's the typical thought process of where a macrophage comes from, from a monocyte. So we performed an experiment called parabiosis. And in this experiment, we surgically joined two mice together. One uh, mouse lacks monocytes. It's uh, called a CCR2 knockout in the red, and the other contains monocytes. And we look at the ability of uh, these green monocytes from the wild type animal to replace macrophages in the heart that are red. So we can distinguish the two uh, animals based on, uh, on color. So if we look at monocytes in the, in the, um, the CCR2 knockout, very few come from that animal because it's deficient in monocytes, and almost all the cells come from the donor. 
Similarly, if you look at CCR2 positive macrophages, almost all of them come from uh, the wild type animal. However, if we look at the TIMD4 positive macrophages, none of them come essentially from the donor. Even over a long period of time, six months, which is uh, quite a bit of time for a mouse, almost 25% of its life, uh, almost all the macrophages uh, come from the host. And these uh, re uh, renew through proliferation. Similarly, these uh, MHC2 macrophages, again, the vast majority of them come from the host. And if we look over time and we compare six months to 10 months of parabiosis, and we look at all macrophages, we see that there's about 15% replacement. However, it's very similar at six and 10 months. It's in a way similar to macrophages that live in the brain called microglia and alveolar macrophages that live in the alveolar space of the lung. Very little replacement. Now, if we split up the macrophages into the three subsets, we see that they have very different life cycles, but importantly, there's very little change between six and 10 months. So there's not slow replacement of the TIMD4 positive and MHC2 positive macrophages by monocytes. It's really a very stable level. And if we look over time, we see that the three subsets are established before birth. So this this time point here, uh, termed E14, is embryonic day 14, which is actually in development. And this is one week after birth. And you can see all three subsets are present um, really throughout the lifespan of the animal. We also use genetic techniques to target these uh, populations. Here we use a genetic technique based on this promoter CX3CR1. I'll spare the details, but essentially when we give this drug tamoxifen, we turn on a gene and make the cell red so we can later find it. So here uh, we've given tamoxifen to the animals and all the cell types, all the macrophages specifically and blood monocytes turn red. And then we remove tamoxifen, that's the tamoxifen off phase. And we can see that blood monocytes lose their label because they're short-lived cells and they're constantly replaced. The CCR2 macrophages are also replaced, but the, the two CCR2 negative macrophages, those long-lived TIMD4 positive and MHC2 positive macrophages continue to be labeled. So once you give the drug, those macrophages are self-renewing and stay there. They have almost uh, stem cell-like properties of renewal. So when we use this genetic technique, we can specifically follow um, these macrophages that have the self-renewing capacity. We call them embryonic derived macrophages. Here we infarcted the animal and we're looking specifically in this infarct and peri-infarct zone. And we see that there's a numerical loss of embryonic derived macrophages in this tissue. And at the same time, we see a very massive increase in recruited macrophages. And you can see here by the scales, it's very different. And using the same genetic technique, we can make the cells not only red, but we can have them express a kill me signal on, this, on their cell surface. And that's called the diphtheria toxin receptor. And then later we can give diphtheria toxin and kill those cells at the time of our choosing. So we did that prior to the myocardial infarction. And what we see seven days after the myocardial infarction in the mouse is the ejection fraction is reduced from about 60% to 30%, but we see no change between the ejection fraction of control and um, macrophages, these specific embryonic macrophages that have been depleted. Similarly, we see no change in the infarct size, here looking at the percent akinetic area at day seven post-infarct. However, what we do see between day seven and day 28 is a drop in the left ventricular ejection fraction, indicating that these mice are developing systolic dysfunction and heart failure if you deplete that population of cells. So I'm gonna change gears here and talk now about hypertensive heart disease. So hypertension, as you know, affects 30% of the world's population. And hypertensive disease can lead to end organ damage. Um, the left ventricle faces increased wall stress, and in that setting, it increases its mass as a, a compensation um, in order to pump against a higher load. And ultimately, this can become pathologic, but, but early, uh, it, it's quite a protective phenomenon. So we were interested in how cardiomyocytes grow. And we model this by infusion of angiotensin II, one of the key uh, clinically relevant molecules in humans, in, into mice through uh, pumps that we implant under the skin. So we use the same genetically engineered mice 
and we infuse angiotensin II. So here we have flow cytometry again at the top, sham animals compared to angiotensin II infused animals. And we're focusing just on these um, embryonic derived resident cardiac macrophages. And in, in the, the depletion scenario, you can see that they're reduced in abundance. And when we do this, and we compare sham to angiotensin II, and we look at the heart weight to body weight ratio, we see that there's an increase in the heart weight um, to body weight ratio with angiotensin II, and that is reduced when you deplete the resident macrophages of the heart. Similarly, if you look at the anterior wall thickness, um, that, that wall thickens in the setting of hypertension with angiotensin II, and that's completely um, normalized or absent uh, when you deplete macrophages. And then similarly, when you look at the LV mass, the mass increases as you would expect after a month of chronic hypertension. And again, uh, with the depletion of resident macrophages, the, the LV mass does not increase. And we can actually look at the cardiomyocytes themselves. So when you infuse angiotensin II, and here we are lighting up the, the outside surface of cardiomyocytes, you see that they are bigger, that there's cardiomyocyte hypertrophy, and that's absent when you deplete resident macrophages. So here again, we're looking at the size of the cardiomyocytes in the graph here with angiotensin II, and it more than, the cardiomyocytes more than double in size. And when you deplete resident macrophages, there's a complete absence of cardiomyocyte growth. So in this setting, um, when we look at resident macrophages, what we see is that during hypertension, they are in red, they slowly increase in number. And this is per milligram of tissue. So the, the, the mass of the tissue is actually increasing and uh, recruited macrophages come in very early during hypertensive stress and then normalize. But this increase in resident macrophages we believe is important. One of the subsets of resident macrophages, this one that expresses high levels of TIB D4 and lacks antigen presenting genes, this is the subset that increases in number, more than doubles in number, and it does, throw, it does so through proliferation. And here we're actually measuring the proliferation of, of the macrophages, and it occurs very early at day four with hypertensive stress. Now, the macrophages are clearly responding to hypertensive stress. So what we did is we sequenced each and every uh, macrophage, resident macrophage in the hypertensive animal. And what we see actually is a variety of different subpopulations of macrophages. You don't have to worry about the complexity in this heat map. But there's a lot of different macrophage transcriptional states. And here we describe 10 of them. This heat map shows gene upregulation. The yellow is up and the purple is down. And each state has its own gene signature. So the, comp the, um, the transcriptional reorganization here is very complex. Um, each uh, individual state has individual pathways associated with it, and they're very different from each other. For example, st cell states one and two, which are, are quite dominant numerically, are related to wound healing and angiogenesis, uh, muscle structure development. And when we look at all these states and we look at the different genes that are um, changed, we can see that the global pattern differs uh, um, when hypertension is induced. So in the, in the gold here is the, is the sham. So this is the steady state where you have individual pathways being represented highly. But at day four of hypertension, there is this dramatic reorganization favoring pathways and cell states that that promote wound healing, angiogenesis, muscle development, lipid metabolism. So you can see that the, a reorganization happens quickly during hypertensive stress. Uh, and then, then by day 28, it starts to return to normal. So when we deplete resident macrophages, what we see here is a loss of LV function and an increase in end diastolic volume associated with an increase in perivascular fibrosis. So to summarize, I've shown you an unbiased analysis of macrophages that live within the myocardium. There are multiple macrophage subsets. We have both recruited macrophages, and we also have resident macrophages that reorganize significantly during hypertensive stress. And these are essential to pre prevent uh, adverse remodeling in ischemia and hypertension. And I'd like to just end here by acknowledging um, uh, Sarah uh, Dick and Sarah Najat, who worked a lot on the ischemia project, and, and Raisa Zaman and uh, Homera Hamidzeda, who worked on the hypertensive project, along with other members of the lab, collaborators, and, um, and funding sources. So thank you very much for your time.